Hello and welcome to the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium. My name is Chris Mikowski, Editor-in-Chief of Emerging Civil War. Delighted to have you with us. Our first speaker today is Derek Maxfield. Derek is an Associate Professor at Genesee Community College in Batavia, New York, hometown of Emory Upton. For those of you who are from Spotsylvania as we are here today, Emory Upton, of course, earned fame at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. Um, Derek has recently earned fame for his brand new book as part of the Emerging Civil War series. It's called Helmira, the Union's most infamous prisoner of war camp from Elmira, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Derek Maxfield. Well, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be here to talk about my latest project. You know, Helmira is... Uh, and, and prisoner of war camps in general have been uh, quite a, a surprise to me. I've studied the Civil War since uh, I was quite young and um, you know, knew the lengths of the tragedy uh, during the Civil War, uh, but it was eye-opening to me the extent of the humanitarian crisis that unfolded over the course of those four bloody years. Uh, over 56,000 uh, died uh, in prisoner of war camps over that time, just over 500,000 incarcerated in total. And although we understand, you know, the, the, that this is just a small number of casualties considered the total number of casualties during the Civil War, over 750,000 now, we believe, um, when you consider that we could have done better, both North and South, when you consider that this was in our power to a large measure to make lives for those that were incarcerated better, it's really um, quite disappointing. Uh, and it tells us much about ourselves, I think, uh, then as today. Uh, this was a project that actually um, started uh, because I was asked by Chris Mikowski to uh, write this book. Uh, but it was something that um, was something of a surprise to me because when I was growing up just 30 miles from Elmira, I had no clue that Elmira was the site of a POW camp. Um, I think I learned in college for the first time about this and was just entirely shocked because I thought by that time I was fairly well versed in the Civil War. And uh, I come to learn that there's a good reason why um, I didn't know about it, and in fact, many people in Elmira didn't know about it. To some extent, it was an exercise in civic amnesia. This was a community that wanted to hide its past. And really, it was only quite recently that um, they began to embrace what happened there along the Shemung River. And for, in large measure, the, the reason for this had to do with being compared to Andersonville. Uh, so Andersonville, many people know, uh, was the POW camp uh, near Americus, Georgia. It was the largest of the POW camps. It was the most deadly of the POW camps of the Civil War. It held over 30,000. It has had a death rate of approaching 30%. And as the war came to an end and the Union came to learn more and more about the tragedy, the atrocities at Andersonville, um, there began to be this kind of back and forth finger pointing where every time the Union would scream about the atrocities at Andersonville, the South would answer, what about Elmira? And this is the way that this is going to go on for 30 some years after the war. Uh, as both sides tried to blame each other for what happened in these POW camps. It wasn't until the 1990s that this community decided to re-embrace its past. Uh, a high school teacher in Elmira at the time led a movement to place a monument uh, on uh, the spot where uh, the camp sat, about 30 acres on the Shemung River on Water Street. And so you see this here. The original flagstaff of the camp was placed near this monument as well at that time. About that same time, uh, the only two modern books until mine uh, were published, one by Michael Horrigan, another by Michael Gray. Both were released within a year of each other. Uh, but before that, the next book you have to look at would be Clay Holmes' book, 
just before World War I. So it hasn't had a lot of attention by historians. Um, and those that knew about it really had no reason to want to uncover this again, fearing that it would be bad for business, bad for tourism, uh, which is an industry that Elmira relies upon quite heavily. So this was part of my interest. Another interest of mine uh, had to do with this man here. This is William B. Reese. This is my third great-grandfather. And in my research came to learn that he served in Elmira uh, during the time that it was a prison camp. He was part of the Invalid Corps, so-called, or the Veterans Reserve Corps. He had been uh, in the Battle of Gettysburg. He was injured on the first day, and after that could not return to full duty. He ends up in Elmira, perhaps guiding, uh, guarding some of the prisoners uh, that I would be studying. So let's start, let's start the story of POW camps in general, just to contextualize this a little bit. So this is Montgomery Meggs. Uh, he is the quartermaster general for the Union. And as the Civil War got underway, one of the things that we see is neither side gave serious thought to uh, the potentiality of needing to hold prisoners of war. Um, and although there were prisoners taken in some of the earliest battles of the war, they were exchanged pretty much on the spot in a kind of informal way that harkened back to the way things were done in the Mexican War. No formal policy at all. And it was in the early days of the war that Meigs suggests to Simon Cameron, who was then the Secretary of War, hey, maybe we should do something to prepare uh, in case we need to hold prisoners of war. Uh, Simon Cameron was more interested, I think, in lining his own pockets at that time than he was in anything else. And uh, as a result, nothing gets done. Um, the Confederates do uh, little or nothing either. So um, then we come to the story of William Hoffman, Lieutenant Colonel William Hoffman. He's going to be appointed uh, at the request of Montgomery Meigs, the uh, Commissary General of Union Prisoners. And one of the things that, that occurs to me in all of this is that if you're going to take this problem seriously, you want to have your best people on this. And when I look back at, at the way that both sides operated POW camps from the top down, uh, part of how they could have done things better is the people they chose to run these facilities. And uh, Hoffman was a good enough officer, but he had no administrative experience at all. Uh, he happened to be available. And one of his qualifications was he was a POW himself for a short time. Uh, Hoffman was a graduate of West Point. He served in the Mexican War. He was in the 8th uh, New York, or I'm sorry, the 8th U.S. Regulars Infantry. Uh, and very early in the war, uh, found himself a POW. He was exchanged in this kind of informal manner. Uh, but while awaiting exchange, he was in Washington, and they said, hey, we've got this, uh, this job. How about you? and this is how he comes to the job. Uh, and I think that when you look at um, his administration, anyway, of the, the POW facilities, one of the things that I, th I think uh, is a characteristic that's important here is his just ingrained frugality. He's really cheap. That's himself, but that's also the way that he's gonna run these POW camps on a real shoestring. And that's something that incidentally makes uh, the Secretary of War, whether it is Simon Cameron, uh, but more especially Edwin Stanton, uh, very pleased because they don't want to spend any more money that is necessary either. On the Confederate side of things, they didn't have as formal an administrative structure when it came to the POW camps. Um, the closest they came was their provost marshal. This is um, John Winder. Uh, who was the provost marshal of Richmond, Virginia. And uh, when the war started, um, he will be placed more or less in charge of the POW facilities uh, in Richmond itself, and that's primarily where their POW facilities will remain for quite some time. Um, and only later, near the end of the war, do they make this in uh, any way more formal. 
Uh, Winder's an interesting guy. He was a West Point graduate, uh, a tactics instructor uh, a little bit after his graduation, Mexican War vet, uh, breveted for gallantry in the field. Uh, he has more of an administrative capacity than Hoffman did, but he has less authority, much less authority than his union opposite. So the POW issue comes to a head at Shiloh. So Shiloh is really the big battle early in the war. It is a battle that opened the eyes of the North and South to how long, how bloody this war is really going to be. And uh, over the course of two days saw over 23,000 casualties. Uh, this also meant that you had hundreds, if not thousands, of prisoners taken on both sides. And Shiloh is in the middle of a vast wilderness. Pittsburgh Landing is on the Tennessee River, which is a water highway out of there. But uh, where the battle took place is really in the middle of nowhere. And so you have to move your wounded and your casualties out of this wilderness uh, to be treated or to be imprisoned. And what this meant was really kind of an emergency in the West at this time for uh, the holding of POWs. Uh, they have to be shipped north, and the Union, in very quick order, has to convert what facilities they have available to them. This might be old penitentiaries, old prisons, old fairgrounds, uh, anything where you could convert to holding a large number of prisoners in a fairly short amount of time. Now, the, the issue of prisoner exchange was really complicated by uh, Abraham Lincoln's stance when it came to recognizing the Confederacy, which he could not, of course, do. He saw this as an insurre insurrection, a rebellion, um, and to treat with them about the POW issues in some ways would be to recognize them, which is something he could not do. And yet the pragmatist in Lincoln recognized that yet we've got to do something. We have to formalize a system of exchange because this really isn't going to work otherwise. And this is what leads to uh, what is called the Dix Hill Cartel. So you had these two men, John A. Dix, D.H. Hill, um, that get together and they come to an agreement uh, largely based on the framework from the Mexican War with some updates. Um, it is largely a man-for-man -man exchange and then a formula of exchange between officers and enlisted men, but at least they have something in place, something that they can work from. Um, and that gives some hope uh, to men that find themselves incarcerated and to some extent empties out the POW camps that were then in place. Uh, but this is all quite complicated by the, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, issued in January 1863. So Abraham Lincoln came to the conclusion that in order to win this war, this measure would be necessary. And um, so he issues the preliminary uh, Emancipation Proclamation after the Battle of Antietam, seeing this as a victory. Um, and it becomes official in January 63. But of course, as you might imagine, it also sends the South kind of into a tailspin over this, and there is some fury. Uh, but it also opens the door to African American prisoners. And this is where the breakdown of the cartel system begins. Um, the high command of the Confederacy, uh, of course, does not want African American soldiers in the field. They are offended by this but they absolutely refuse to treat them as white soldiers. Um, and this complicates exchange dramatically. Uh, Seddon says at the time that black soldiers cannot be recognized in any way as soldiers subject to the rules of war. And they absolutely refuse to exchange African Americans. Uh, this gets worse as time goes on because not only uh, is the Confederacy refusing to exchange any African-American soldiers they take, but reports start to get back to Union authorities that many men are shot in the process of surrender. Uh, the casualty rate among African-Americans that are incarcerated is very high. Over the course of the war, over 800 
uh, black POWs are taken, which is really a small number of those that, that the number should reflect. Um, and of those that do go into captivity, only 35%, I'm sorry, 35% die in captivity. Um, and so Lincoln's response to this uh, at the time is to halt exchanges. Well, when you halt exchanges, that means that both sides now have the burden of taking care of these POWs. And where are you going to hold them? And of course, as the war goes on and the fighting gets worse, this problem uh, becomes worse and worse. They have to open new camps. Uh, they have to be on the lookout for new facilities. And uh, the one that most impacts our story is Point Lookout, Maryland. So Point Lookout, Maryland um, results from uh, the fighting in 1863. The camps are overflowing. And Camp Hoffman, AKA Point Lookout, uh, is created at that time. It's a beautiful area. It's a former resort area. But it also had the added advantage of being very near the biggest Union hospital. Um, so this hospital, you can see uh, down here on the point, it looks like the spokes on a wheel. Um, Hammond General Hospital is the, the largest of the Union hospitals. It has very good transportation access. It's also a place that would be hard to escape from. And so they begin to set up camps very near there. And you'll see those in the upper right of the screen. Uh, now, Point Lookout uh, will very quickly swell to over uh, 20,000 at its peak. This will be the big feeder camp to what becomes Elmira. And there's another view. Uh, at about the same time, uh, early 64, uh, Andersonville is created in the south. We talked about this a little bit earlier. This was a camp uh, that will come to house over 30,000. Uh, it's really just a big pen where Union soldiers are thrown, and they will have little fresh water. They will have uh, food occasionally uh, as, the, as the Confederacy can get supplies to them. But almost immediately, uh, reports start to get back to the Union about how things are going there in the state of this, the prisoners in the Confederate charge. The Overland Campaign is another thing that really directly impacts the overflow and then the, the real humanitarian crisis of the POW camps, because this is a campaign that's going to see over 65,000 Union casualties, over 35,000 Confederate casualties, all the POWs are taken captive. There is no exchange at this time. And so these camps are just busting at the seams. Grant says at the time uh, that it's hard on our men to be held in Southern prisons, not to exchange them, but it's humanity to those left in the ranks to fight our battles. He felt to exchange prisoners would help the South. It would help them to fight on longer. And he felt this was a way to quicken the end of the war, even if that meant that Union soldiers are going to suffer in the process, which they certainly did. So Elmira comes into the story because of the Union camps busting at the seams. Where are we going to put these men? Um, the load at Point Lookout was becoming almost unbearable, um, and they were beginning, beginning to have security concerns there. Um, and so they decided to, to look about for an, another location. And Elmira suited them quite well because Elmira was already a draft rendezvous. It was on a major railroad hub. Uh, it was next to a canal. This was a place that had been a feeder location for Union soldiers early in the war. So many of the facilities were still there and still available. Um, and so there'd be a minimum of preparation necessary uh, to get this ready. So at that post uh, was Lieutenant Colonel Seth Eastman. Uh, he uh, was kind of your average soldier. He was not a great able administrator. Uh, he was a topographical engineer by training. He graduated from West Point. Here's a guy that uh, was also really not up to the job either. Um, but 
he is a good soldier, and you can see in his correspondence with his superiors that he's ready to do what they want him to do, uh, though he is not in great health himself. He's also kind of conflicted because his real interests aren't military. His real interests are in oil painting and being an illustrator and an artist. Um, and really, the, the stress and the physical toll that um, the camp takes on him will lead to his removal uh, in a short amount of time. But while he's there, uh, he does the best that he can. One interesting um, side note on this, though, is Eastman's wife, Mary Henderson, was a Virginian. She was an FFV one of the, from one of the first families of Virginia and uh, very pro-slavery and was so agitated uh, by the book written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, that she wrote her own version called Aunt Phyllis's Cabin or The Way That Life Really Is in the South in answer to this. Um, and so that had to have been controversial. Uh, it's more interesting when you consider that Harriet Beecher Stowe herself summered in Elmira, New York. So the, these two ladies would have been circulating in the same part of elite uh, Elmira society. One wonders what those conversations were like. Uh, one of the more interesting figures in Elmira was the commandant of the Elmira POW camp, Henry Colt. Uh, he also is kind of on the injured reserve, if you will. Uh, he was with a New York regiment, uh, and he had been injured in battle, uh, the 104th New York, and uh, they put him on duty uh, at Elmira to run the POW camp. And uh, it's really interesting that when you look at the memoirs of the prisoners in the years after the war, the vitriol is quite thick. Um, and um, some of that, I think, is guided by the controversy over uh, Andersonville at the time. Uh, but what is really interesting is, although they have terrible things to say about the conditions and the food at Elmira, especially the winters, they love this man. Love this man. Uh, and in the memoirs, especially the memoirs of Anthony Kiley, who we'll talk about, um, they talk about how humane and kind that this man was. So he's their jailer. And they write in their memoirs about how terrible a place Elmira was, and yet they love the man that is in charge of it, which I find kind of interesting. In January, when he returns to duty, the prisoners give him a parting gift on a silver platter, literally on a silver platter, uh, a chalice that is made uh, from a coconut. That's the, sh that's the, the bowl of, of this cup, handmade chalice. Uh, as a gift to him on his way out. You'll see here the outlines, the rough outlines of the POW camp at Elmira. You'll see that the wall at the top there is right on the Shemung River, right on the Shemung River. This is definitely built on a floodplain. Foster's Pond, one of the things we'll be talking about here in a moment, uh, you'll see uh, about a third of the way down, and uh, the largest amount of the camp uh, is there in the bottom half. This encompasses over 30 acres uh, of land. And just to give you some uh, notion of what this looks like today, this is an overlay of that map on the modern neighborhood. And you'll see uh, near the top there, um, Water Street. Uh, you can see Foster's Pond overlaid there, and it's placed on the Shemung River. So there are probably at least 100 homes that sit where the POW camp was uh, during the war. Foster's Pond uh, was one of the big controversies uh, in the occupation of this land. Foster's Pond is just kind of a farm pond, but it was very still water. And early in the occupation in July of 64, uh, uh, they set up the sinks, the latrines, very close to the pond. And they were very poorly sighted, and so the pond very quickly is getting filled with urine and excrement. Um, and it's still water. There's no fresh water really running through it, and so it begins to stink really bad. Um, and at the time, um, this was cited as a real health concern. Uh, an inspector from the War Department cited it as such, citing miasmas, which was the word used at the time for these odors, which they believed would make men sick. Um, so this was cited as an issue 
very early on, and yet nothing is going to be done about it, despite the fact that they feel that this is hazardous to the health of the soldiers in their charge. There are also no hospital facilities in July of 64 when this camp opens. Uh, the prisoners are marched in, they are housed in tents, uh, and that is the way that it will remain for quite some time. One of the early tragedies in the history of the camp was a wreck of a train full of prisoners uh, on its way to Elmira. I believe this was only the third or fourth shipment of soldiers. It was uh, carrying 800 prisoners from Jersey City, and uh, it collided head-on with a coal train in the mountains of Pennsylvania near Shahola. Uh, in that wreck, 14 guards are killed, 40 prisoners are killed, a number escape, and the, the, all of the townspeople and the people from miles around come to help to load up a new train and bury the dead and deal with this tragedy. And we know that uh, it was the middle of the night that the wounded arrive in Elmira with no advanced word. So in Elmira, they had no, no idea that this tragedy had happened. All they know is the train arrives unexpectedly and you got vast numbers of wounded that need immediate treatment. Uh, the facilities to treat these wounded were not in place yet, and so this leads to untold amounts of suffering. Uh, at about this time, they also have to establish a, a cemetery to bury the dead. Uh, before August 1st, uh, already 11 prisoners had died. Uh, the Shahola dead, by the way, uh, will not be removed to Elmira until the 20th century. Uh, they were buried on the spot down in Shahola, but they'll be moved later. This was something that was put into the charge of a uh, very interesting man named John Jones. Jones is, uh, was one, at one time in his life a slave who ran away to his freedom, settled in Elmira where he became a prominent conductor on the Underground Railroad, ushering hundreds to their freedom, uh, but settled there and found a new life. Uh, he was so trusted that they made him caretaker of the local cemeteries, including Woodlawn Cemetery. He was also placed in charge of the prisoners that died at the camp. And he will have almost 3,000 of those to deal with during his tenure as the caretaker. Another interesting figure in all of this is Eugene Sanger. So uh, he does not arrive until at least six weeks into the existence of this camp. They are operating on local physicians at the start. But Sanger is sent to become the chief surgeon, uh, a native of Maine, uh, went to Dartmouth College before going to school, medical school in Philadelphia. Um, he was not uh, a man that was really well respected in Elmira, especially among the prisoners. Uh, Anthony Kiley, one of the more prominent of the prisoners who wrote a memoir, said he especially hated Sanger and in fact accused him of murdering the prisoners in his charge. And, and Kylie has some really interesting quotes. So he called Sanger a club-footed little gentleman with an abnormal head and snaky-looking little eyes. Kylie himself uh, had much to say about his incarceration. He'll be there from July until October. And he's worth mentioning because he's not the ordinary prisoner. So when you look at the ranks of the prisoners in Elmira, these are your foot soldiers from Lee's army largely. Almost no officers. Uh, and Kylie um, actually was a civilian when he was caught uh, near Petersburg. He was called out um, to help the local militia and was in the wrong place at the wrong time and gets snatched. He was a member of the Virginia House of Delegates at the time. Um, he was incarcerated at Point Lookout and then sent on to Elmira, uh, but where he strikes up a really interesting friendship with Henry Colt, and in fact, he's given a special job, he's given special quarters, he's given special meals, so he really gets abnormal treatment. And yet, after the war, uh, his memoir will be one of uh, the most interesting to read, but filled with uh, some of the worst vitriol of any of the memoirs. Invinculus is the name of his memoir, and it's definitely worth reading. Another interesting uh, aspect of this camp was uh, the enterprising gentleman on the outside in the town, 
who set up an observation platform, which you can see on the right side of the screen there. And they'll charge you uh, 10 cents to go to the top and get a look at a real live Reb. Now, as I said before, uh, Seth Eastman didn't last long. His health really was not good when the tenure of the camp began. Um, and his health just grew worse and worse until they finally were forced to remove him. In his place, they put Colonel Benjamin Tracy. Now, Tracy uh, is not on the injured reserve. Uh, really interesting man in his own right. He is one of those politician soldiers that uh, Grant and Sherman so disliked. Uh, he was an assemblyman in New York before the war, a lawyer, a district attorney. Uh, though, to give him credit, uh, you know, he raised, raised the regiment. He served with the 109th New York and, in fact, earned the Medal of Honor for his heroism at the Battle of the Wilderness. So he earned his stripes, but he was a politician through and through. And it's very clear that when they place him in Elmira, the War Department knows who they're getting. And he has a clear idea of what is expected of him. They just want him to keep his head down, not make any noise, and be prepared to follow orders from the War Department about how they want these prisoners treated, which includes the cutting of rations twice during his tenure, despite the fact that food was abundant in the area around Elmira. This is what has led to some suggesting that what you had going on here in Elmira was a union answer to the atrocities in Andersonville, a concerted effort to punish Confederate prisoners because of the treatment of Union soldiers at Andersonville. And the evidence definitely uh, sustains this. As I told you before, they were housed in tents. The, the prisoners were housed in tents at the beginning. Um, so by October 1st, you have 9,000 prisoners in Elmira, but you only had uh, a small number of barracks. Uh, the first snow arrives in October, and you are still going to have hundreds of men's in tents into January when the final barracks get up. Uh, the men not in barracks are sleeping on the ground, on the bare ground largely, unless they have some straw or something else to sleep on. Every prisoner is given uh, two blankets, uh, but of course we all know, uh, those of us that are from western New York, how cold it can get in Elmira that time of the year. Uh, we know that by January 1st, there was a foot of snow standing on the ground. And so these men would have been sleeping in the snow, standing in the snow and ice for roll call each morning. It must have been really hard on an Alabama or a Mississippian. And here is a view of the reconstructed barracks uh, that you can see now uh, that have been built there. Another interesting prisoner is Marcus Tony. He's a Tennessean. Um, and in his memoirs, uh, we get an interesting view of life in camp because he contracted smallpox while he was there and had to be housed in the smallpox hospital. The smallpox hospital was, was set up very down close to the Shemung River, away from everybody else to provide isolation. Um, and they thought that this was the best place to put it. Um, Tony uh, finds himself there uh, and gives us a really uh, riveting account of how these smallpox patients suffered. The men who died there, he said, were dragged out and left in front of their tents in whatever position a man was when death overtook him. In that position, he froze. And they would stay there, frozen in these odd positions for as much as a day before their bodies would be removed. Food was always an issue at Elmira. It should not have been. Uh, it was an area of plenty. Scurvy was a real problem inside of Elmira. And again, uh, there's no reason that this needed to be because there was an abundance of vegetables in the Elmira area. Uh, but as I already mentioned to you, the Union High Command issued a cutting of rations twice uh, in the uh, first six months of the existence of the camp. And so men were forced to look out for themselves in some cases. Uh, there was a lively market in muskrats. Uh, There's reports of dogs going missing. Uh, they would uh, scrounge for whatever they could get. Another prisoner said, there are a lot of drones or lifeless men, he wrote in his memoirs, do less persons who moped around, 
pining away for whatever sufficient food to eat, losing their humanity, eating almost anything a brute would eat, even gangrene poultresses and the like. Another interesting part of the story has to do with the spiritual life of the Confederates uh, housed in Elmira. A number of local uh, pastors and ministers would come uh, to minister to the spiritual needs of the prisoners. Some were welcomed with open arms. Others were a little bit too preachy uh, for the likes of prisoners. Thomas Beecher was probably the most prominent pastor in Elmira at the time, pastor of the Park Church. That is the brother of Harry Beecher Stowe. One of the things that we know that was happening inside of uh, the camp was these prisoners desperately looking for something to do. Boredom was their biggest enemy, uh, apart from the cold. Um, and they looked for different ways to uh, pass the time. And these are some pieces, some uh, pieces of jewelry, a die made by prisoners. You can see these now in the Shemung Valley Historical Society. Very enterprising men there in Elmira. They would make rings and trinkets, and they would make deals with the guards who would sell them in the community, and uh, some of the money would actually make it back to the prisoners. The medium of exchange was tobacco uh, in high demand north and south, and this kind of became the replacement for money there for a time. So the winter of 64-65 was really quite brutal. We know that the temperatures were below zero for much of early January, deep snows, howling winds, and in the barracks, those that were lucky enough to be in barracks, there would be one or two stoves, at first wood and later coal stoves, but they were given an allotment for the day, and when that ran out, they would be cold. And so largely what would happen is they would be warm for a few hours, run out of their allotment of fuel, and freeze for the better part of eight hours. But at least they were sheltered from the wind. Shelters provided for them, unlike the prisoners in Andersonville, who were provided with no shelters at all. Now, as I said before, this was built on a floodplain on the Shemung River. Shemung is a, a substantial river and is surrounded by high hills. And I already told you that there are deep snows on those hills. So it does not take a genius to figure out when that snow begins to melt, that uh, is a river that is going to swell rapidly. So this is something that the authorities in Elmira should have seen coming. Benjamin Tracy, in fact, we know was warned several times in writing, hey, you had better you know, figure something out here because that river is going to come booming in February, March, or April, and this is exactly what happens. There was a quick thaw and this massive flood that washes down the valley. It was called the St. Patrick's Day Flood. This was March of 65, and um, it wiped out three-quarters of the fencing along the Shemung River. Uh, almost 90% of the camp was underwater, and they had to, uh, in fact, rescue the smallpox patients who were in vital danger of drowning. As I said, the smallpox hospital was way out down close to the river itself. And so they, they mounted this rescue effort in the middle of the night with jury rig rafts and tow ropes. And you had guards and prisoners side by side working through the night to rescue these prisoners some of whom unfortunately fell into the icy water and will die shortly after, but many of them were in fact rescued. Uh, for their efforts, the prisoners were at least given a ration of whiskey. So the dismantling of the camp begins to happen in March of 65. They begin to move prisoners out. By this time, Grant has given uh, permission for exchanges to be resumed. Uh, in fact, these were resumed before um, the, uh, the Appomattox campaign. And, um, and so Elmira began to empty out little by little. It wasn't, though, until July, of course, long after Appomattox and the surrender at Benton Place, that um, these men will go home. Sadly, 140 men 
were not able, they were not well enough to travel and will be staying in Elmira uh, for some time. Some actually of those 140 never leave. The camp began to be dismantled almost immediately. Uh, part of the lease uh, agreement between the foster family who owned the land uh, and the government was that the land would be returned to its original state as much as possible. So all the buildings were dismantled and sold off. They were auctioned off. Uh, but, you know, remnants and reminders of what was once there became very sparse in a short amount of time. One of those that existed into the 20th century was the former dead house, uh, where they would hold dead bodies until they could be buried over at Woodlawn Cemetery. Clay Holmes writes about this in his book, shortly before uh, World War I. Today, we have an organization in Elmira called the Friends of the Elmira Prison who are working really hard to bring back that history and acknowledge what happens there. Uh, their efforts have included the reconstruction of an original camp building. This uh, was made from lumber that was held in storage ever since the Civil War, reconstructed. About 80% of it is original lumber, and you can see it in Elmira today. They've also uh, reconstructed an original barracks. So let's just take a quick look at the numbers uh, before I wrap up here. As I said, over 400,000 soldiers were held in 150,000 different facilities. 56,000 died in captivity. Uh, the Elmira numbers include uh, almost 10,000 held, uh, death rate of 24%. This is why Elmira gets compared to Andersonville, the death rate. In many or most other ways, I don't believe that there is an adequate comparison here, a good comparison at all. But what I argue in the book is that it's long past time for uh, finger pointing, and it is time just to acknowledge that both sides could have done a much better job taking care of the prisoners in their care. Thank you very much.